Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Video Village. Hi, I'm Jay Byrne from Roadkill Entertainment. I'm recording this on uh, January 12th, 2014. And I'm going to get this up on the 15th. So it's a couple days before it goes up. Just so you know when this stuff is actually recorded. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit different of a... For, well, no, it's not different of a format, but basically what I'm doing here is I've decided that I think I can do two shows a month. And instead of just doing one um, one hour, one hour or an hour and a half show every month or so, I think I can do two. So what I'm going to do is on the this is this is my plan for now. It could change. But on the first of the month, the first or the second, depending on how long it takes to upload something, if there was an issue um, around the first of the month. The uh, the longer episode is going to go up. The episode, well, maybe not longer, but the episode that's uh, that's got a guest, that type of stuff. Or if I have a co-host and I have my buddy Mike Welch on with me and we're talking to somebody else, the ones with the guests are going to go at the beginning of the month. And then on the 15th, I'm going to do like a solo podcast, which is just going to be myself kind of catching up and reviewing movies and talking about some things I want to talk. Because this way I don't have to waste all my time waste a lot of time during the episodes with like a guest or Mike as my co-host just rambling about stuff that I can do when I'm just sitting around all by myself. So today is going to be one of those episodes. <clears throat> it's um, Although I do have an actual subject that I'm going to get into a little bit after, my topic for today is going to be, I went with 15 instead of 10. Everyone always does their top 10 favorite movies of all time. I went with 10, my top 15 because there's just a couple of movies that I, I really felt I wanted to talk about and I threw those in there so <clears throat> it went up to 15 so today's subject basically is going to be Jay Burns top 15 movies of all time and I'm going to discuss about talk about those movies and maybe I'll turn somebody on to something that they haven't seen or whatnot so we'll have to see how that works but I also got some blu-ray reviews that I want to do this week because I haven't done blu-ray reviews in a while actually I didn't do them in the last one I think I did it the one before that but I had my buddy Pete Lambert on from Diamond Camp Films, which that was a really good discussion. I think we got some interesting stuff out there. And um, so I hope, you know, people who like to listen to this check that out. And, you know, I hope you guys got something out of that. But, um, yeah, so uh, today I just want to go over some stuff. I mean, I've been I, – I buy movies all the time. I've got like a huge collection of DVDs and Blu-rays and mainly Blu-ray now. But I still buy the occasional DVD for a movie that you can't get that easily. Um, but I wanted to do, uh, an episode where, you know, I caught up and talked about some of the stuff I got around Christmas time, some of the new releases that I picked up and whatnot. So I'm going to start moving right along here. And actually, I think I'm going to talk about first, I'm going to, I, this was like my Christmas present to myself. Well, from my wife, basically to me for Christmas, I finally was able to place an order for Synapse releasing released, uh, Demons 1. And Demons Two in these uh these three thousand these limited edition three thousand limited three thousand copies edition of Blu-rays Blu-ray DVD combos for Demons One and Demons Two Lamberto Bava the uh, Dario Argento Lamberto Bava flicks from the eh, mid eighties it's like eighty five and eighty seven I think um yeah so i got those literally yesterday they showed up i've been waiting for a while i was kind of frustrated because i placed my order with synapse on december 20th <clears throat> and then literally that was the day that they went out of the office for the holidays and they weren't back until the third january 3rd so i was waiting for my stuff to ship and it did finally ship so it's here but uh okay so i have i'll start with demons one here Demons want, I'll, I'll just have to say that if any, now they're around, I think it's 46 and change for each one of them. If you, when you, when you order off the Synapse website and that's really the only way to get it, except you can go to, uh, I think it's diabolique, um, dot com, which, which was, which also sells them, but they've been out of stock on them. When I checked, they were out of stock on them. So I just ordered directly through Synapse because that's the only way you can get them right now. Um, I have Don May Jr., the one of the guys from Synapse on my Facebook feed, and he has stated multiple times to people that they at the, at the moment they have no plans to do standard editions. So the only way you're going to be able to get these is through them or maybe through diabolique.com. 
But, you know, yeah, they're a little pricey, and <clears throat> it took me a while to kind of like, at first I was kind of pissed off that they were so pricey. But, okay, anyway, uh, Demons, here we go. This, I mean, if if you have the Arrow version of this on Blu-ray or DVD, I, I don't know if they did a DVD. I know they was the old Anchor Bay DVDs. This is the version I have, man. It it The transfer is amazing. It is so clean, so clear. Like, I don't know, I, I was actually, when I was watching the movie last night, and I'd seen Demons a bunch of times, I I was really amazed at the amount of detail in the um, in the gore effects by, I think, Sergio Stivaletti is the guy who did the gore. I could be wrong. He did a lot of stuff with, um, it's not listed on the front here. I'm pretty sure it is, though. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I can't tell right now. But, um... <clears throat> Regardless, I found that watching these like Italian gore fest horror movies from like the late 70s, early 80s on Blu-ray has been a lot of fun because there's so much detail in these special effects that they made that really has not been seen since like people watched it on the big screen in the movie theater. Because when you're watching this stuff at home, you're watching it like, I mean, most people, when I originally saw this, I saw a VHS copy rented from a video store on a crappy little, like, 20-inch set or something like that, probably less. So it's it's pretty cool to actually see, it just in general, like, a really clear version of this movie. Like, it is super clear. And uh, there's an article you can read on Synapse website. Um, it's it's a update about their releases because I guess... Uh, about sometime last year, their original proposed release date was pushed up a bit because they had to do some more work on them. I think that's the reason why they ended up being so expensive and so limited as well. But they had to do more work on them because the masters that they got had a bunch of digital anomalies in them and all kinds of other stuff that just needed to have work done on it. Like um, there was, since the master that they got, which was also used for the Arrow Blu-ray, which seems like Arrow didn't do too much to it. They just took it off their, the HD master they got and put it out. It was taken, it was a scan of the negative, of the original negative. Some scenes in the beginning of the movie weren't color corrected properly. Like literally there were shots where it would go from nighttime to daytime, back and forth, but they weren't fixed because initially speaking, they were fixed for the final release prints when the movie came out. And on all previous versions that had come out of the movies, they were color timed properly. But for some reason, the uh, HD master that Arrow got, they, I guess they didn't check it very well or they didn't bother to really do too much work with it. They just put it out the way it is and they were unaware. It seems like kind of an obvious problem to me, like an obvious like mistake, but like to put that out like that. But anyway, and the plus there was some sound effects missing on the mono track for some reason, but no fear. These Synapse releases are near perfection. I mean, they're amazing to watch. That's I mean, and there's a ton of bonus features on here too. Like, I haven't really gotten to dig into them yet, but I mean, it's got audio commentary. It's got featurettes like uh, Carnage at the Cinema, Lamberto Bobber and his Splatter Masterpiece, uh, Dario and Demons, the uh, thing about Dario Argento, a thing about Luigi, a thing with Luigi Cosi on Demons. There's so, there's a bunch of stuff on here. Seriously, I mean these are such great releases, and they come with um, it, the, actually Demons One comes with a reprint of the the card. The, it's the ticket that's handed to them. It's like it says Metropole on it. It's awesome. So yeah, I mean if if you were thinking of picking these discs up and you were on the fence because of the price, don't be. They are they are awesome. They're like perfect releases of these movies. I can't imagine that these would actually ever get any better of a release than this. So, eh, dropping stuff. Ugh, sorry. But, um, yeah, so this is awesome. I, Demons 2 looks amazing as well. I got both of them. And Demons 2 is also packed with a bunch of bonus features. And the, the transfer for Demons 2 is a little bit, I mean, it's, it's good. It's really good, actually. But it's, it's a little bit more problematic than Demons 1 because I guess Demons 2 was shot on a specific film stock that was also used for the movie Aliens, the James Cameron movie Aliens. And what basically, it was a really grainy film stock. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this. I was telling my wife, Katie, last night. I'm like, you know what? Movies like Footloose and stuff from the mid-80s were probably shot using this film stock because I remember those movies looking really, really grainy. And then Paramount put it out on Blu-ray and scrubbed the crap out of it. But, I mean, it, it still looks good. It just looks very digital. 
but um it's not filmic that that blu-ray but anyway regardless of that but yeah but this one i mean they, they left the grain in and they color corrected everything and they they put the same kind of work into it there's some uh frame jitter in a few shots but the uh, from what i read the frame jitter was most likely inherent on the original negative and they tried what they could try to try to correct it but it just it made it look worse so they just kept it the way that it was so yeah so those demons releases are freaking awesome i haven't dug into the all the bonus features yet but there's plenty of them on there there's i mean they're they're worth very close to what they're being charged for they're worth the money i mean and the steelbooks look beautiful i'm not a big steelbook fan i don't really collect steelbook releases but when you know there's something in a steelbook that i'm picking up for the first time i mean i'll get the steelbook version if that and, and the covers look great they have like original artwork on both sides and stuff like that it's really cool actually I, I think the front might be newly commissioned artwork but i'm not sure they might just be alternate versions of the original posters but they look pretty damn cool anyway so uh, all right let me move along here to another one i'm gonna go i'm gonna do this one next um i just picked up uh the reissue of robocop on blu-ray and um, supposedly this is remastered, this is retransferred from a 4K master, like a newly remastered version of Robocop because of the remake coming out and all that stuff. So they probably decided, well, we'll reissue it again. The great thing about this is, is it not only has an all new Q&A with the filmmakers, which is pretty cool. It's like 45 minutes. It's from some screening somewhere that they did. Um, it has all pretty much as far as i can tell i think there might be one or two minor things like a trailer or like a still gallery missing but it has all the previous bonus features that were on the special edition dvds that came out and anybody who's ever followed robocap oh and it's the unrated uncut the x-rated cut of the movie so that's yeah it was i say x-rated because when the movie was originally rated it was rated it was considered an x-rated cut but now it would just be unrated or an nc-17 but regardless this has all the bonus features and the documentaries and stuff so this is i mean this is the special edition of robocop this has everything that you'd want on it the transfer looks pretty damn good like it's a big improvement over the previous blu-ray which if you have the previous robocop blu-ray it's i don't know it's kind of smushy looking it's 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 blurry it's i don't know it it was okay at the time but when you see the difference between this and that i mean like i have the three pack that has robocop one two and three so basically i just bought this one and i'm just keep the three pack for two and three which two and three look pretty damn good actually on the on the blu-ray three pack so there's really no reason to do anything to those but one eh, one had its issues it was an older blu-ray it was released when blu-rays first came out had absolutely no bonus features on it so maybe it had a trailer but i don't even know if it had that but um yeah so this new version of robocop is awesome it looks gorgeous this is the version to own. Like, if you're a fan of RoboCop, and I am, I've, I've always been a fan of this movie. I don't know, it's just, it's kind of a crazy little weird, slightly campy, comedic action movie from the 80s, you know? My grandmother took me to see it when I was like 11 or something like that in the movie theater. But, um, yeah, it's this is a great disc, so pick this one up if you intend to pick up RoboCop on Blu-ray. Or even if you have the old one and you're curious if the new one's worth it, it's definitely worth it. So, um, okay, I'm gonna move along, and... All right, I'm going to talk about... Okay, we got some Scream Factory releases. I picked up a couple new Scream ones that were put out. Uh, Crawl Space and The Beast Within. <laughs> I picked up both of those. Um, they both have some cool bonus features on them. Some, some little featurettes and stuff like that about the making of both movies. I kind of forgot how cool Crawl Space was. Crawl Space is directed by a guy named David Schmoller. These... Oh, just to say, these don't have the... Uh, the outer sleeves like uh, uh how scream factory usually does like a slip cover over it and they have the the alternate artwork these aren't technically collector's editions they're just like regular releases but the actual covers are a version of the original cover art and they're they are reversible sleeves so you've got like two choices to choose from although i think the ones that they choose is the actual main cover for the releases the ones that are you know when you buy them the stock ones i think they're the better covers myself personally but um yeah so crawl space was a movie that was made what in uh 1986 uh it was directed by a guy named written and directed by david schmoller he also made a movie Ter uh, tourist trap in the 70s and he uh was involved in the puppet master series as well i think he directed the original one and some of the sequels and stuff and you know i had forgotten how cool crawl space is crawl space is a, a trashy little movie with like with uh, Klaus Kinski playing like this landlord who rents out 
rents to people in the building. But he's just crazy. He's like this ex-Nazi and like, I don't know. It's a cool movie to watch. It, you know, he basically just ends up start stalking the people in his building. And there's not a lot to say about the movie other than it's, 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 it's creepy, violent, kind of eerie. It's, it's a bit short, actually. If I, it's like 80 minutes long. It's a short movie. But it's a lot of fun to watch. And I had forgotten. I actually thought I didn't like this movie. And then I kind of took a gamble on it, and I did. So that's um, Screen Factory put that out. Crawl Space. That's worth it. The Beast Within is a batshit crazy movie. It's, I mean, it's about a wear cicada. So go figure that, all right? It's about this huge freaking, this this guy who gets infected by, this kid who gets infected by something. And what is it? He gets in, I forget how he gets infected. Oh, no. The mother is raped. When she's, when she's younger, she's raped by this beast-like thing in the woods, which is just a giant, like, cicada as a man. It's like a weird cicada. I don't know what the hell it is. But... And it rapes her in the woods, and she ends up having a kid. And when the kid gets to around his 18th birthday or so, he starts to show signs, like that he's turning into this thing, you know. And it's it's like a metamorphosis movie. The whole movie, he's just. And this movie is from what, uh, 1981. So the whole movie, he's just like you know, totally. I don't know. It, it's a hard movie to describe. <laughs> I'm kind of at a loss of words for this movie. It, it's crazy. It was directed by a guy named Philip Mora, and he actually made a movie called Communion with um, Christopher Walken, which I have always liked. It's a alien abduction movie based on a book, actually, that was written supposedly true. But um, but yeah, so this movie's just kind of crazy. If you like monster movies, early '80s style monster movies, this is what you're going to get with The Beast Within. The Beast Within is is an 80s monster movie, but with kind of like kind of a darker, more disturbing edge to it than than most of these movies had. It's got a couple cool people in it actually. It's got uh, who's in it? Ronnie Cox. Oh, uh, we just talked about RoboCop oddly enough. Ronnie Cox is in it from Deliverance and RoboCop. Uh some named BB Besh, she was in Tremors. Uh, Paul Clemens from Communion. I don't recognize some of these names, but these are the people that are in the movie. LQ Jones from The Wild Bunch and R.G. Armstrong from Race with the Devil. Oh, yeah. He's awesome. The guy from Race with the Devil. He, he played the police chief in Race with the Devil, that 70s movie with Peter Fonda. I freaking love that movie. But um, it's got an audio commentary on it and actually has a featurette, I think, it does, even though it doesn't list it on the back. It's got a few extra things on here that aren't listed on the back. Worth picking up if you like these type of like 80s trashy slasher slash monster movie type things. Crawl Space and the Beast Within. So yeah, those are pretty cool. Um, okay, I'm going to move along. I'm going to... All right, I'm gonna, I got two more here that I'm going to go through. Actually, I got one that technically falls into my 15 favorite movies of all time list. So I'll talk about it when I get to it in the list. But uh, so we got 21 Jump Street, Okay. <laughs> I know you're laughing at me probably right now, but, um, I heard so many good things about this movie and I'm into like, you know, buddy cop movies and comedies from the eighties and stuff like that. And I just couldn't help, but I had extra money in my pocket. It was like 10 bucks at Best Buy. And I'm like 21 jump street. And I just keep hearing, Oh, this is a good movie. You check this movie out. This is a good movie. All the reviews I read say this movie is better than it deserves to be. So I'm like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I gotta say, I loved it. It's got uh, Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum in it. And, I re oh and uh, who else is in it? Ice somebody one of the one of one of the oh Ice Cube one of the ices. <laughs> um, no, I it was a great movie. It was a lot of fun. It's you know if you're familiar with the TV show Twenty One Jump Street from the '80s, actually there's a kind of a fun surprise cameo in the movie that I won't actually I won't say because this way if you watch the movie it's it's a lot of fun when it just happens because I wasn't even expecting it. And it popped up and I was like oh cool. Um, but it's basically about these two cops that are lazy, dumbass cops that end up getting transferred over this, this division where with Ice Cube is like their captain and he, their chief, I guess, or whatever you call that. And he sends, he puts them out, he sends them to high school to, to find like a, to a drug bust type thing. Because there's this new drug going around the high school that a lot of kids are using and they want to like find the source and stop it so he sends them to high school and basically they do everything that you could possibly do wrong it's it's uh it's kind of reminds me of like a beverly hills cop in a sense like the way that it was handled now no, i really enjoyed it i thought it was a cool movie and it's an action comedy type thing but i mean i don't know this i love i mean i'm a big kevin smith fan and 
I, I, I liked Cop Out, even though a lot of people didn't like Cop Out. But this is kind of like a better version of what Cop Out could have been. Like, this is almost like better than Cop Out. They're different movies, but I liked Cop Out. Cop Out was more like Stake Out or friggin' um, Fletch or Beverly Hills Cop. It had that vibe, and I always liked Cop Out. But uh, yeah, so you know what? If you're on the fence about seeing the movie 21 Jump Street, just watch it if you like these type of movies if you like buddy cop movies from the 80s like lethal weapon you like freaking die hard you like those type of movies like just watch it and you know get over it <laughs> because i actually i really did enjoy the movie and i thought the movie was great and it's something i'd watch over and over again so i, I had i had a lot of fun watching this movie so it was a good gamble for 10 bucks so. all right now this is my last blu-ray review of the day well except for the one that's in my top 15 um this movie, I've been hearing nothing but good things about this movie through different, you know, horror podcasts that I listen to, like Killer POV, and um, I listen to the Adam Green one, the movie Crypt, with Adam and Joe, Joe Lynch. And everybody's been talking about this. Like, they even had the director, Mike Mendes, on. It's a movie called Big Ass Spider. And it sounds, you look at the title, you look at the cover, you go, Big Ass Spider? What the hell is that? Um, I, I don't know. I, I was really, really surprised at how fun this movie was this is a throwback to monster movies once again classic like you know nature attacks man type monster movies from like the 70s and the 80s with a big ass spider and it just you know it's 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 basically it's about this uh exterminator guy who kind of falls into this whole situation where he discovers that there's these larger spiders just kind of around just you know what i mean he just notices that things are happening and he gets sucked into this whole thing and ray wise is in it and he plays a military guy and stuff it kind of has the same vibe as those those sci-fi you know sharknado type movies which i actually haven't seen sharknado i hear it's kind of fun i might give it a chance um <clears throat> how and i think it was originally intended to be one of those type of movies but the filmmaker who made it the guy mike mendez he's just a better filmmaker than that and he he went out of his they went out of their way to make a fun movie like this is just a fun movie yeah it has crappy cgi in it and sometimes the crappy cgi kind of takes you out of the movie a little bit but overall the plot is good the characters are great like it's just a funny fun movie to watch and i don't know it, it, it was it was a throwback to a movie specifically a movie that i related it to was arachnophobia it's like a modern version of arachnophobia and it's just a lot of fun to watch it's got fun characters in it and I, you know, I, it's very enjoyable. So if you come across it, you want to see it, you've been thinking about it, you see this big ass spider. If you go to friggin' Walmart, um, it's called Biggest Spider because they censored the cover for whatever reason. And it just looks like a total hack job the way they did it. But um, they just kind of made it look like graffiti writing over the ass part where it says big ass spider. They Like the graffiti goes over it and it just says G E S T, big ass spider. It's stupid. Because on the back of the disc where it actually has a little slug line for the actors and stuff like that, it actually still says Big Ass Spider. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I you know, the corporate mentality doesn't make any sense to me anyway. So, but yeah, so check that out if you're inclined to check out that. It's, I mean, the Blu-ray itself looks good. I mean, it's shot digitally. So, I mean, this stuff looks pretty good. Um, it's got some bonus features on it. I haven't really dug into those yet. I, I've actually kind of been feeling i've been wanting to but i haven't had a chance to but it does have a nice selection of bonus features it's got interviews with the cast and crew trailer uh featurette on south by southwest um <laughs> stars greg grunberg and lumberto boyer tell director mike mendez how they really feel about him i just read that that's the first time i ever read that that's kind of cool but um it's just it's a fun thing to check out so check it out if you're interested and I think, uh, all right, we're running in close to a half hour, so I am going to get into my top 15 movies of all time. And now, before I go any further with this, I kind of want to explain how I came up with this. Because I've been refining my top 10 list for a long time. There are certain mainstays that always stay on the list. But my theory about, you know, and maybe it's different for some people, but my theory about how you would judge your top 10 movies, your top 15 movies or whatever of all time would be more along the lines of 
something that you can watch over and over again. Like if you have a movie, I don't care if it's like the worst movie in the world. I don't care if it's like a crap movie by most people's standards. But if there's a movie that you pull out of your movie collection and you watch every other month or every couple of months and every time you put it on, you sit through the whole thing and you love it and you can watch you can watch it over and over again. To me, that's how I judge a top, you know, one of your favorite movies of all time. That That's how I judge my favorite movies of all time because... How else would you judge it? I can't even think. You could, you know, try to be arty about it and judge it by filmmaker and all this stuff. But really, if you're not watching the movie, then it's not really your favorite movie of all time. If it's not something that you watch at least, say, like once a year, or if it's on TV, you can't shut it off, then I, for me, that I don't think that would make the list. So with that in mind, this is how I came up with my top 15. Like I said, I went to 15 because I just, I don't know. I had extra movies that I didn't I did I did want to talk about. So all right, so I they're in they're in well I'd say no particular order, but what I'm going to do what I did with them is I put them in order by year. So I'll start from the oldest to the newest and we'll work our way up. So my first one that I have on the list here is Harold and Maude from 1971 with Ruth Gordon and Bud Court. I love this movie. I've always been a big fan of this movie. And, you know, it's it's kind of an oddball because I never thought I'd actually, it'd be something that I would care that much for. Um, an ex-girlfriend of mine basically forced me to watch the movie. She's like, you got to see this movie. And I ended up loving it. The whole movie itself centers around <laughs> the main character played by Bud Corp is this is sort of suicidal kid he's playing these like suicidal pranks all the time he, he they're not even like really suicide they're just like calls to attention because his parents his mother's rich and he lives in this like m like mansion with his mother and he's always playing these dumb tricks all the time to try to get her attention like faking suicides and stuff like that and, i mean it's hilarious the first couple of the first like half hour of the movie is hilarious with all his fake suicide attempts but um then the movie basically pick ups where picks up where he meets an older woman played by Ruth Gordon, who, um, this old lady who's just, she's like this crazy eccentric old lady who goes around stealing cars and doing crazy stuff. And she's got kind of like a hippie mentality about her. And I don't know, he just finds her fascinating and he starts hanging out with her. And, you know, there's a love affair between the two characters, which is really odd because it's like a 20 year old kid. Actually, I don't even know if he's 20. I think he's like 17 or something like that. And no, he's he's old. No. Yeah, he's like 18 because he's supposed to be going off to like military college or something like that. And a like 80-year-old woman. It's really kind of a weird concept for a movie, but it works so well. And it closes out so beautifully. It's got such a beautiful conclusion to the movie. It's one of those, it's, it's a very uplifting movie. For a movie that's all about gloom and doom, kind of satirically, it has a very uplifting ending. I always say, and actually it's funny, we always said, um, we uh, made the movie Hometown, and you better, I made the movie Hometown, and you better watch out. And we got a giant pentagram, and we named, I named the pentagram Harold, because, after Harold and Maude, because I thought, you know, that would kind of like take the negative stigma away from a pentagram that's hanging around in my house, because I associate Harold and Maude with a positive thing it's it's a dark thing that becomes a positive thing so that's how that's that's where i came up with it harold and we actually he's harold the goat lewis now is what we call our pentagram but um there's more to that story maybe i'll have a mic tell you the other half of it sometime um and okay well oh and um also just a quick note about the next episode i'm going to have my buddy mike welch as a co-host and we're going to talk about conventions and stuff because he goes to a lot of conventions he's worked conventions he's met a ton of awesome people so we're going to talk about that in the next episode and that's going to be the next big one that will be up on february 1st or 2nd around there so look forward to that i hope you hope my listeners out there if i have any I say my listeners, I mean the listener, the one person. If you're listening to this right now, I'm talking to you. So I hope you uh, enjoy it, and I think it'll be a pretty cool episode. But anyway, I'm going to get back on track here. So so that was Harold and Maude. I love Harold and Maude. It's one of my all-time, it's, it's in my all-time top 10, top 10, actually, list. But it's, you know, part of the 15 as well. Okay, now let's go on. 1972, here we go, ready? Last House on the Left, the original Last House on the Left with David Hess, uh, Fred Lincoln, Mark Scheffler, and Jeremy Rain. I mean, I love Last House on the Left. I've always been a fan of the movie. 
it's kind of campy. It's kind of silly at times. The soundtrack is awesome. David Hess wrote a great soundtrack for it. In a previous podcast, I discussed my history with David Hess and how I, you know, got to know him a little bit. And I have friends that know him very well. And it's sad that he passed away. And it's kind of a big loss in the horror community. But like, I don't know, this movie for me, it just, it, me and uh, my buddy Pete Lambert, it just, it, this movie emphasizes that period of time when we were constantly just watching VHS tapes, renting VHS horror movies and watching them and getting to know them. And I remember my father originally watching this when I was really young and I walked into the room and he told me to leave because it was during like one of the nastier bits that takes place in the woods about a half hour into the movie. And yeah, so I love Last House on the Left. I always have. This, I've talked more in detail about Last House on the Left on a previous podcast, so I, I don't think I'm going to get too deep detailed into it right now. But it's a great 70s movie. It's gritty. There was a lot of controversy around it when it first came out. Uh, projectionists used to actually cut frames out of the movie themselves. Like you know, Community standards kind of dictated which version of the movie you saw. So for a long time, it was very hard to see a complete uncut version of this movie. And it was kind of like... You know, that's kind of like what the whole point of it was to us. We were trying, to, we were trying to find this elusive, uncut version of Last House on the Left, and finally, all these years later, we've seen a complete version of the movie. And yeah, it you know, it is what it is. Not that much different than the previous versions that we saw, but there was that history to it. And you know, and they were uh, David Shulkin wrote a book about it, and it's it's just a really it's a fun movie. If you like '70s movies, you can handle the camp. And the music is great if you're a fan of like folk rock from the 70s and stuff like that. It's David Hess's soundtrack is awesome. Um, buddy Mike just picked me up the um, the reissue of the the LP, the uh, the vinyl that came out, which is freaking awesome. It's red. It's a red marble vinyl collector's edition. It's really freaking cool. It's from um, it's not Death Waltz. It's another company, but you can you can look it up. You can find it online. Last House on the Left vinyl reissue for the soundtrack if you're into that but uh yeah so last house on the left that's my number two so we'll move on now to the next one which is 1974 the original toby hooper's the texas chainsaw massacre this is another one that's just i mean it's it's one of those movies that when you first saw it was just so powerful and so strong that I, I, yeah it's, it's really hard to describe what it's like to see this movie for the first time. It's probably different for um, like younger generations, I guess what you call millennials or whatever, the younger people out there, because they're used to the remakes and stuff like that, which everything is pretty overblown and violent. The funny thing about the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is there's not even a lot of violence in it. I mean, it's, it's intense, but there's not a lot of blood in the movie. It's not gory per se. So, I mean, that I think affects the way that people look at this stuff now you know they look at it in a very different way so i don't know i mean and, and, and i think a lot of young the younger generation has a problem looking at movies from the 70s because they're dated to them and i mean even though they were dated to us in the 80s when i saw them for some reason we were okay with it like it's different now people look at dated things in a very different way now but um i love the original texas chainsaw massacre it's just it's a classic movie. It's intense. It's its power is never diminished as far as I, every time I watch it, it's still just as strong as it was when I first started watching it. Maybe not that first initial viewing, but we used to have screenings of this movie. Me and my buddy Pete, we'd have friends come over and we'd like, I remember we, we ran the sound through my guitar amplifier and we played it really, really loud. And it was, it's intense. The movie's so intense with the chainsaw soundtrack, the chainsaw buzzing throughout half the soundtrack and everything, and the screaming and yelling. I mean, it really dictated Toby Hooper's style. I mean, I don't know if I really need to explain the plot of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because I would imagine that most people listening to this know the original, or the remake at least, of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which as far as I'm concerned, is a, is an inferior movie to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, a bunch of kids go out to uh, an old farmhouse and they kind of get one by one wiped off by this crazy family living out in the middle of nowhere. And it, and it escalates from there, basically. <clears throat> and, you know, Marilyn Burns is in it. She was awesome. She was also in Eaten Alive. Toby Hooper's Eaten Alive. 
And she's she's great in the movie. She plays the main character of Sally Hardesty. And it's funny, I always, if you listen to the very beginning of the movie, there's an opening scrawl. Like, you know, very, like, you know, I wouldn't say like Star Wars, but I mean, if I say that, most people know what I'm talking about, like the scrawl at the beginning with the words. And there's a narration over the opening scrawl. And it's really funny because John Larroquette is the guy who actually narrated it. He, Night Court, Dan from Night Court, if anyone used to watch that show back in the 80s. <clears throat> and it, for years, I didn't even know that. But that voice is so familiar. You hear it and you're like, hey, I know that voice. So, yeah, I mean, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is an awesome movie. The original 74 version, you know, it's definitely worth checking out if you're a fan of the horror genre. Like, it's such a seminal movie. And I I still think it holds up quite well. I mean, most of the effects are practical and real. Like, you know, like, like the set dressings and stuff are like real bones and real. So, I mean... There's nothing cheesy or fake about that because it's real. I mean, it is. It, it, I mean, there's. It, it can't be fake because it's real. So, I mean, I mean, it's not real death or anything in the movie, but the stuff is handled pretty well, I think. All right, I'll move forward now. So now we're at 1975, and there's actually two movies from 1975, but I'll go with my pretty much my all-time favorite movie my all-time favorite movie is Jaws, 1975 Jaws, Steven Spielberg. It is just a fun entertaining movie it's kind of like an action thriller i guess you would call it it's just i don't know i've always been a huge fan of jaws i started watching jaws when i was a kid and yeah that's basically i mean there's not a lot to say about jaws i mean a lot if you haven't seen jaws i'd say check it out because and i really hope they never remake this movie because it's just such a great movie it's got great characters you got richard dreyfus roy scheider uh robert shaw like it <clears throat> It's just a lot of fun. It's a fun movie. And actually, I mean, this is the movie that really started the box office, like, blockbusters. This and Star Wars were responsible for, you know, starting the blockbuster thing. Where, actually, the term blockbuster was from, you know, back in the day where the line used to run around the block. That's why they called it a blockbuster. And these were literally the first movie, some of the first movies, I guess, I know it's always credited as being like the first movie that really did this. The movie made so much money that the studio was like, wow, okay. And then they started like modeling future movies after the structure of this. There's so many movies from the 70s, like Grizzly and stuff like that, that they just copy the Jaws plot. As a matter of fact, Alligator is another one from like 1980, and that just rips off Jaws' plot as well. But Jaws is awesome. Steven Spielberg's Jaws. It's one of my all. It's it is my all time number one favorite movie, and I don't know. It's just one of those movies I can watch over and over and over again. The characters are good. It has some pretty stark, creepy moments. I mean, I would assume most of you out there would know what Jaws is, but you know, Jaws is basically the story of a giant great white shark that that comes into like, uh, like Martha's Vineyard type bay. And actually, it's filmed in Martha's Vineyard, but I think it's called Amity, Amity Island. And um, it's supposed to be Amity, New York, I guess. And yeah, I mean, the shark shows up and it just starts killing people. And you get a couple, a local town sheriff and like a fisherman and this uh, and uh, a shark expert played by Richard Dreyfus. They all go out on a boat to hunt the shark. And it's just it's a fun movie to watch. I keep saying fun movie, fun movie, but I mean, I mean, these are all fun movies to me. Well, some of them aren't fun, but I do really enjoy these movies generally. No, take a sip of water here. Hold on a second. All right. Now we're on to the other movie from 1975. And actually this one coincides with my Blu-ray reviews because <clears throat> I actually picked up the Criterion Blu-ray release of Robert Altman's Nashville. You know, if you're not a fan of country music, you're probably not going to be into this. And I am not a big country music fan, but I tend to like like the 70s down-home style country stuff, you know. But this is just such a great slice of life movie. Robert Altman has got like an, a, an interesting style <clears throat> because Robert Altman's style is very improv like his he's i guess apparently there is a script but they just they run off the script constantly the actors and it's just you got this character this group of like oh god i don't even know how many characters it's like 15 characters or something like that and they just it's 
all these stories intertwine together and it's all takes place in Nashville and you've got like you know, you've got the the person that wants to become famous in country music and they're trying to get up. You've got the famous people in country music who kind of could barely care about what they're doing right now. You've got these weird little like love triangles between other characters. Robert Altman movies are hard to describe, but the whole movie centers around the the Nashville country music scene in the 70s, basically, because it's 1975. And they're all fake characters. Karen Black is in it. I mean, they're not playing real people. They're playing the characters that they are in the movie, which in some ways are like some some real people. But um, yeah, Nashville is a great movie. It's kind of oddly and slyly comical. It's a long movie. It's close to three hours. But um, yeah, it's just an awesome movie. And if, if you've never seen a Robert Altman movie, because you know Robert Altman has always talked about as being like you know <clears throat> a big film guy you know and a lot of people like talk about Robert Altman all the time but if you've never seen a Robert Altman movie I think Nashville is a good place to start because it's just an entertaining movie it has kind of a quirky 70s vibe with the country music and stuff like that and I think it's a good in to Robert Altman's career because Although I love MASH, which is another Robert Altman movie. MASH is a harder movie to get through for some people. Some people it's not as funny as some of his other stuff. So yeah, so we've got Nashville is an amazing movie. And I really do think if your fans, if you, even if you just want to check out 70 Cinema, if you're fans of 70 Cinema, you need to see Nashville. Nashville is awesome. And this new Criterion Blu-ray that came out looks amazing. It's got audio commentary. It's got a documentary with like tons of like the actors and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun and it's a great movie to watch. So I would definitely, definitely say, you know, check out Robert Altman's Nashville. So that's my, um, that's the next one in my list here. That's my actually, what, the one, two, three, four, five. That's my fifth one so far. So, next one here, 1976, Brian De Palma's Carrie. <clears throat> I am a huge fan of Carrie. I have not seen the remake of Carrie, actually, yet. I hear mixed things about it, you know. But I am a huge fan of Brian De Palma's original movie, Car uh, his, his take on Stephen King's novel, Carrie. Which I hear is the novel is a little bit different than the movie, but there's not... There's not so many changes that it feels like a completely different movie, so uh, a different story. But you know, and it was not familiar with Carrie. Carrie is a story about uh, this young girl who is who has telekinetic powers, and she's just learning that she has telekinetic powers. But she lives with a very religious mother, and her mother's like basically thinks she's like the devil because she can do the things, move things with her with her thoughts and whatnot and most of the movie is like like a teen drama actually like a like a, like a about this girl trying to gain acceptance among her peers and her classmates and they torment her and all that stuff and then it turns into a crazy horror movie towards the end so <clears throat> i really i love carrie carrie's an awesome movie sissy spacek is it plays carrie in it and she's she just does an amazing job as the character. So for me, Carrie has always been a big one for me. And I'm very kind of skeptical about the remake because I don't know what to make about it. I've heard various things. I've heard some people say, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was, it was a good time, but I, I don't know. To me, Sissy Spacek will always be Carrie. So that's that. But, um, okay. So Carrie, 1976, Brian De Palma. So now let's, I'm going to move forward here. Uh, the, my next one is Rocky from 1976. Rocky's a great movie. And I think, I think Rocky gets looked back at in kind of the wrong way. Because it's really just a drama about this character trying to do something with his life. Like he's this down and out character. Yeah, he's a boxer, but... It's almost like a side note through most of the movie. And it, you know, played by Sylvester Stallone, who when everyone, a lot of people look back on Sylvester Stallone's career, they think campy. But, I mean, Rocky is like a totally serious, straightforward drama. And, I mean, it has some great, like, beautiful moments in the movie. I mean, it's one of those movies that has a love story tied, tied into it throughout the whole movie. But 
I don't know. The love story is so well handled. You've got these two misfit characters that you can't help but like it. I mean, it's. It, I mean, obviously, you wouldn't call Rocky a chick flick by any means because it's Rocky. It's about boxing, but it really, really is like a standout movie from the 70s and it went on to make like a bunch of there's a bunch of sequels to rocky there's two three four five and rocky balboa which was i liked them all and i think rocky balboa was probably the closest to the feel of the original out of all all the movies because it you know it's about that downtrodden kind of character but yeah so i mean I've, i've always been a huge fan of rocky right to the last minute i mean the end of the movie is just I mean, I don't know. It's I don't want to give it away for anyone who hasn't seen it, but I mean, I'm assuming most people by now have seen Rocky. But if you haven't seen it, the end of the movie is just it's a powerful kind of beautiful ending to that story. And it's weird to be talking about a movie like Rocky in that way, because, I mean, people don't look at that movie like that. But I mean, Rocky is a great 70s drama it's a big part of 70s cinema and if you can't tell most of my favorite movies are from the 70s just because seven the 70s were such a time for cinema man it was like people were really experimenting with ideas in the 70s and a lot of the stuff that's been like beat to death and has been turned into commercial formats originally evolved from the 70s so yeah so rocky 1976 all right, moving right along. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're on the eighth one on my list right now. It's 1977, Annie Hall, Woody Allen's Annie Hall. And if you've never seen a Woody Allen movie, I mean, he made like a bajillion movies, but I would suggest if a person had never seen a Woody Allen movie to start with Annie Hall, because Annie Hall is kind of the movie that started his career. It's actually uh, When Harry Met Sally is very much almost like a modern remake. Well, not modern for now, but modern for like, you know, the late 80s. <clears throat> remake of Annie Hall. Where it's just like this basic love story. You've got this um, this character, Alvy Singer, played by Woody Allen. And he's just like, you know, this this obsessed with death character, again, kind of like Harold and Maude, which is interesting. He's just obsessed with dying. Act, no, wait, when, when Harry Met Sally is the one where he's obsessed with dying. No, but so Alvy Singer is kind of obsessed with his mortality too. They see that's was a copy. They uh, the Billy Crystal character pretty much copies the Woody Allen character, Alvy Singer from um, from Annie Hall. And you've just got this character, and it's all about his relationship with this woman he meets, named Annie Hall. And uh, it's played by Diane Keaton, and she just has this great quirkiness about her. I, I would actually think that like, and I hate to use this word because I can't stand the term hipster. But I would think that a movie like Annie Hall would appeal to the hipster culture or like the emo culture of today because of the actual, the characters and the style of the movie. Like I, I, you know, because I mean, Annie Hall herself, she's like this quirky, I guess you would, she would be considered like a hipster for her time. Although I, like I said, I can't stand the term hipster, but it it does kind of fit like the, the, the word, the term does kind of fit with this movie. And I don't know you just got these two quirky characters and you follow them through this on again, off again romance throughout the whole movie. And, and it's not a typical romance movie. I mean, this movie pretty much started like the chick flick formula. This is the movie that started that formula for romantic comedies. But what's so funny about it is, is it, it's the most different than most of the romantic comedies you see nowadays. It's a very, very different type of movie. So, yeah, I mean, if you've never seen Woody Allen's Any Hall, or any Woody Allen movies in general, I mean, I'm a fan of Woody Allen to a certain degree. I mean, I like I like Annie Hall. I like Manhattan. I, I dig Hannah and Her Sisters. That's a cool movie. Um, and there's an uh, older movie called Sleeper, which is actually kind of funny. It's got Diane Keaton. It's right before Annie Hall, actually. Um, but Annie Hall is the one to get you into Woody Allen if you're a Woody Allen fan. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sorry, I just keep counting because I keep losing track of where I am. I'm on uh, number nine. It's 1978, the George Romero movie Dawn of the Dead. I love Dawn of the Dead. <clears throat> it's not the first zombie movie of its kind to come out. That I guess that kind of the one that was the first zombie 
the real zombie that wasn't like voodoo zombies and stuff like that because there were some older movies like I Eat Your Skin and stuff like that that were like voodoo zombie movies from like the 60s and everything. But the real like zombies like dead coming back to life, you know, after you die, you turn into a zombie and come back. The Walking Dead style zombies. <clears throat> the real thing that started it all was Night of the Living Dead. But Dawn of the Dead from 1978 basically follows a small group of characters that end up in this mall, the shopping mall. And they just end up like, you know, killing off the zombies and living in the mall and trying to, uh, you know, <clears throat> make a life in that mall with the zombies and stuff that are that are outside the mall. And they're, they're always like a, a they're like an omnipresent threat all the time. They keep showing you the zombies aren't going anywhere. Even though they're locked in the mall, those zombies are always out there. And there's a lot of stuff about society. George Romero likes to add his social statements into movies and stuff like that. And he always says the mall was kind of like his take on consumerism at that time. You know what I mean? And it's hilarious because even to this day, I can look at pictures from like like a Black Friday sale or something like that. <clears throat> and you see like a ton of people standing at the doors trying to get in. And I mean, it's like a shot right out of Dawn of the Dead. It looks just like the zombies at the mall trying to claw in. So, you know, he did. He he was a bit. His social commentary was kind of on the dot for these movies. They did remake Dawn of the Dead. Uh, Zack Snyder remade it in the 2000s. And it wasn't a bad remake, actually. I think it was scripted by James Gunn, who's actually pretty funny. I, I dig James Gunn. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so the original Dawn of the Dead is the way to go, though. I mean, I the remake is fun to watch, but I, I, always, I always say go back to the original first because... I mean, that's where it all started. That's that's where the stem of the idea came from. And I mean, if you're fans of, like, say, like, The Walking Dead, I do say, like, fans of The Walking Dead trying to get into George Romero stuff would probably dig Day of the Dead because that's the closest to the style of Walking Dead. But my favorite um, George Romero zombie movie will always be Dawn of the Dead because that's, like, the epic. That's, like, George Romero's epic, man. It's, like, a two-and-a-half-hour movie. Well, the longer cuts are like two and a half hours, <clears throat> but it's still over two hours. And it's just, it's a very unique take on the culture of the 70s. And it's got some fun characters. You've got Ken Foray in there, which is might be an introduction to Ken Foray. This, I think it's, it might actually be Ken Foray who worked with Rob Zombie and stuff like that. <clears throat> this might actually be a introduction to him as a character. So as as an actor in films um so okay now we're going to move on now we're gonna, I'll, I'll jump forward number 10 my number 10 film uh which is 1979 we're at 1979 now number 10 film is over the edge it was directed by a guy named jonathan kaplan and written by uh tim hunter and charlie haas Tim Hunter went on to write. Actually, he worked on Twin Peaks a lot as a director. I think he did a lot of TV stuff. But he also went on to um, uh, write and I think he directed. I don't know if he directed, but I know he did write uh, a movie called uh, Tex, which was based on an Essie Hinton novel, which I always liked growing up with Matt Dillon. And he also made a movie called, he wrote a movie called River's Edge, which is a great <clears throat> early 80s I don't know, like crime drama. Like it's it, it's one of those type of like like real life stories, you know. It's it's a movie. It's like it's like a compliance or like a, you know, a boys don't cry. It's based on a real life incident, and it's such a it's a disturbing little tale of a bunch of kids that find a dead body that their friend kills somebody, and they got to keep keep it a secret. But I mean, I'm getting off the subject of Over the Edge. But Over the Edge is an awesome movie. Over the Edge is about a bunch of kids. Um, who live in this uh, little town. It's this, this little like suburban community called um, New Granada. And they basically what it is is these kids got nothing to do. So they just they go out and they cause trouble. They're punks. They throw parties, they drink, they you know break into houses, they do all kinds of stuff. And they're pretty much doing it to get the attention of their parents because their parents are all too busy either working their jobs or just ignoring their children. So their kids are just going out and wreaking all hell on the town. And it culminates into one big incident at the end of the movie, which ties it all together. And I mean, Over the Edge is just a great movie. It's really like, it's a perfect kind of companion piece to like a rebel without a cause or something like that. It's... <laughs> It's the 70s version of, say, like a rebel without a cause, where you have 
these kids and they just they're just causing all kinds of trouble and the parents don't know what to do with them and it's it's a statement on its, of of its time period definitely <clears throat> uh, definitely for that era from 1979 <clears throat> but yeah i love over the edge <clears throat> Great movie. Not a lot of people have seen it. There's not a lot of actors that you can I can name out of the movie that like people would recognize. But every time I show the movie, uh, Matt Dillon's in it. He's really young. It's like his first appearance in a movie, actually. And he's basically just playing himself, which was a little punk. And he pretty much played that throughout his the whole first part of his career. But uh, yeah, Over the Edge is awesome. And I love that movie. <laughs> I've always been a big fan of it. Okay, so now we're going over the 10. We're at 11. So... My number 11 movie is from 1980, and it's The Blues Brothers with Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. I absolutely love The Blues Brothers. I like musicals to begin with, and it's just a fun musical. Some people find the movie a little bit long. I never get bored with it. It's just, it's it's a lot of fun to watch. There's some great music in it. I lived in Chicago for six years, so that actually helped me to appreciate The Blues Brothers even more because the movie takes place in Chicago, and, it, and, you know, they talk about a lot of Chicago landmarks. I mean, the entire end of the movie, which is a giant chase scene, takes place outside Daly Plaza, which is in downtown Chicago. I mean, <clears throat> how the hell they ever shot that that end of that movie is, is insane. To even think about shutting down a major city or metropolitan area like that. Like, it, it's pretty crazy. But my throat's raspy today, so <clears throat> bear with me. The more I talk, the more it starts to go away. But, um... Yeah, The Blues Brothers is awesome. It's a lot of fun. If you like kind of silly comedy, it's directed by John Landis, who also did Animal House, which is another movie that I freaking love. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we got The Blues Brothers there. It, it's just, there's not much I can say about The Blues Brothers. It's just fun. It's a good comedy. It's kind of an action comedy. I, I don't know. It's Watch it. You'll enjoy it. That's all I can say. From 1980, The Blues Brothers. Okay, now I'm number 12. We're jumping up here a little bit to 1985 now. And this is a new movie that I've kind of added to my best of, my favorite list. And because I find myself watching this movie over and over and over again, and I find something new about it. It's kind of like a so bad it's good movie, but it is, it's, it's a good movie regardless. It's Charles Bronson, Death Wish 3. It was directed by a guy named Michael Winner. Now, it's funny that I say Death Wish 3, but what people have to understand is Death Wish 3 is the most batshit, like, action sequel of the mid 80s there I, there's nothing like this movie that i can even think of out there i mean there are a lot of movies that are, are really trashy but this was like a movie that played in big theaters this was a popular movie for its time period it was released by a company called canon it has a golden globus movie which they, they had a whole bunch of cool movies that these guys were involved in um break in one break in two which are interesting in hindsight but i still enjoy them <clears throat> And they were responsible for a lot of action movies from the time period. So, I mean, but Death Wish 3, I mean, the whole story is basically, it's, a, it's the same story in every Death Wish movie. The Charles Bronson character, he's a uh, Kersey. Uh, Paul Kersey is the character that he plays. Moves to a new town, trying to escape, like, I don't know, his past life or whatever, and his, his previous life. And he ends up killing, he ends up, you know, meeting a girl and falling in love with her. And she always ends up getting raped and beaten by a bunch of thugs. And then he has to go on a revenge spree and kill the thugs, which is basically the same thing. But this one, they have that as well. But you've got this apartment complex that he lives in, literally surrounded by the worst thugs you've ever seen in existence. All these thugs live to rape, maim, beat, they don't care they laugh about everything they are the most ridiculous group of thugs that you've ever seen in a movie like they just they're just ridiculous and they're they're just like horrible horrible human beings that just do this shit constantly and of course charles bronson comes up with a way to get back at these people but i mean there's so much going on in this movie actually it has um uh from bill and ted alex ugh, i can't think of his name now but He's he one one of the characters in Bill and Ted. He's in it in a small role as one of the thugs. But I mean, come on, man! This movie is just so batshit crazy and insane. I can't even imagine how anyone wouldn't enjoy this movie. It's just it's 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 a blast to watch. 1985, Death Wish three. You don't even need to watch the other Death Wish movies. I mean, it is so 
The plot is so threadbare and basic, but the movie is just so fucking entertaining. From like frame one to to the very end, like the complete blowout at the end. I, I don't even know what to say about this movie. You've got an apartment full of like old people just getting back at all the thugs in the neighborhood, and and the way they do it is just insane. So. I find myself watching this movie repeatedly over and over again, so it ends up in my best, my my top movie list. <clears throat> it's 1985, man. Death Wish 3. So, all right, let's move forward now. I got three left here. I'm on 13. 1993 is where I'm at right now. Dazed and Confused. Richard Linkletter's second feature film as a director. He did Slacker, and then he did and he got he got like the studio deal and he did Days and Confused. Days and Confused is so much fun. It is one of these like it's you know, it reminds me of like that it's just like that 70s show as a movie, but like done very more realistically. And um and I didn't like that 70s show when I first watched it, but I've grown to appreciate it over time. But uh yeah, it's awesome. Days and Confused is a lot of fun. A lot of great 70s music trashy characters i mean and i'm not even into like the whole drinking and smoking pot and stuff like that but it's just a bunch of trashy 70s regular guys you know i always i always the movie always appealed to me because it always reminded me i always thought okay that's my dad and his friends when they were kids and it's just you know they they hang out and they end up going to this party and it's the whole movie takes place on um the last day of school of the school year and um it's the last day of the first day i think it's the it's I can't remember. I think it's the last day of the uh, of the school year, and uh, you've got like the the new freshmen coming in, and you've got the the seniors, the I think they're juniors at the time. They're getting ready to go out because they're going into their senior year, and it's all about you know you've got the typical hazing type of stuff in it, and there's a lot of fun people in it. Parker Posey is in it. Uh, Jason London, one of the Londons, either Jason or Jeremy. I think it's Jason London is in it and um ben affleck actually it's i think it's one of i think it might be i think it's ben affleck's first performance in a movie as o'banion and he's hilarious in it I, I don't know these characters are great the movie's a lot of fun it's kind of a 70s nostalgia movie kind of akin to the likes of like an american graffiti if you're familiar with george lucas's american graffiti but it's, it, it is is an american graffiti for the 70s is what it is but uh that's 1983 dazed and confused richard linkletter awesome check it out Going to 1996 now, Joel and Ethan Cohen, Fargo. I, you know, every time I watch Fargo, it's funny because Fargo is one of those movies that it was never one of my favorite movies, but I just found myself watching it over and over again, and I love it. I love all the characters in it. It's completely entertaining from beginning to end. <clears throat> it's just a crazy little story, um, and Steve Buscemi's in it, and he's awesome. And I really like um, Francis McDormand. In the Coen Brothers movies, like uh, Blood Simple, and you know she's in Burn After Reading, which is a great friggin' movie. And a lot of people would go to Big Lebowski, which I love Big Lebowski, but <clears throat> Fargo was just—it was like their first breakthrough movie. The Coens, well, the, Blood Simple was kind of big for them on the fe- on the, uh, I think it was a festival circuit. But um, <clears throat> Fargo was just—it's just a lot of fun. It's just—I mean, you got this uh, this group of um, uh, the movies basically. Let me see. Let me get this right. The movie is about a a local police, like like a, a local, you know, police officer played by Frances McDormand. She's just there's just investigating this whole weird scandal thing that's going on with um, William H Macy playing like this guy who runs a uh, he work he he's a salesman at a car lot and. He comes up with a way to steal a bunch of money and they're trying to figure out where the money went and all this stuff. And it just, if you've ever seen a Coen Brothers movie, it escalates to these crazy proportions where people end up getting killed over nothing. It's like the craziest stuff happens for no reason. It's all, and it's all about money and it's all about, it's just a really, it's a really fun movie. And I mean, if you, if you like these type of movies, it's from 1996, it kind of has that, independent 90s vibe going on like clerks and reservoir dogs and those type of movies um it wasn't really an independent movie it was kind of a bigger movie for them but fargo it's so much fun and the whole thing takes place in the mid the midwest the minnesota and this is it's minnesota right yeah i think it's minnesota but they all they talk like fargo you know they all have that like really like thick accent and it's 
I don't know. It's just it's just it's a, it's a fun movie. Um, I'm gonna move forward now because <clears throat> I'm I feel like I'm losing my voice. But I'm on my fifteenth one right now. <clears throat> my fifteenth movie is The Devil's Rejects from 2005, Rob Zombie's second movie feature film as a director. Um, I loved House of a Thousand Corpses. Great movie. Same characters. This is actually a sequel to that. <clears throat> Devil's Rejects. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of the 70s. It encapsulates everything I love about the 70s and 70s horror and 70s in westerns. And it's, it's really like a horror western, the movie. And <clears throat> it's got such a great group of characters and it ends in such a balls to the wall like shootout crazy type of way you know i love the his use of music his use of 70s stylistic elements from like movies like chainsaw massacre and hills of eyes and last house on the left and he takes a lot of that stuff but <clears throat> um and incorporates it into the movie yeah this is a grisly movie this is this is not a ha- this is a depressing fucked up little movie but the Devil's Rejects is such a good movie. I saw the movie in the movie theater and I went back and saw it like five times in the theater, which I never do. Like I literally just kept wanting to see the movie on the big screen because it was so great with the music and the style and the, I don't know. It, it's a cool movie. It's akin to the likes of 70s horror, like Last House, I Spit on Your Grave, you know, Hills Have Eyes. <clears throat> it has that feel and that style. So The Devil's Rejects, Rob Zombie, Love it. Check it out if you're a fan of horror movies. Um, it's technically a sequel to the House of the House of a Thousand Corpses, but that's how that works. And so, all right. So that was my list. I just I got through the whole list here. Um, I guess not much more I could say about Devil's Rejects other than Devil's Rejects, other than it's bloody violent, has some great characters in it, and it's just a lot of fun to watch. I mean, you got Sid Haig playing a fucked up guy in clown makeup. I mean, it, it's just it's just a great friggin' movie. But <clears throat> um, to me, anyway. But so my list was, uh, so those are my 15, Harold and Maude, Last House on the Left, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Jaws, Nashville, Carrie, Rocky, Annie Hall, Dawn of the Dead, Over the Edge, The Blues Brothers, Death Wish 3, Dazed and Confused, Fargo, and The Devil's Rejects. So there's 15 movies. That's my 15 all-time favorite movies that says a lot about me as a filmmaker and a person. But that's it that's all i got for you this week um for this yeah for this episode but i i hope you got something out of that i hope you enjoyed it um like i said before next episode which is going to be the beginning of february is going to have my buddy mike welch as a co-host and we're going to talk about conventions we're going to he's going to tell some great stories about people he's met and worked with at conventions and we'll probably start doing something i'm calling the incidents progress report and it's going to be the two of us talking about where we're at with the new movie and we're going to keep updating people as time goes on so thank you very much for listening to roadkill entertainment's video village and uh yeah and i i hope you come back and i hope you listen to more and because i'm just going to keep talking so um if you want to check out roadkill entertainment you can go to jayburn j-a-y-b-y-r-n-e 75.wix.com slash roadkill entertainment one word and yeah so check us out on there you can like us on facebook uh we also we also have i also have a bunch of roadkill entertainment stuff on youtube as well which is which is where some of you might be listening to this but yeah and we're going to be hosting this podcast from now on is going to be hosted on something called the internet archive so that i can just keep archiving these podcasts online and they were available for multiple download formats and stuff like that so i hope you enjoyed it i hope i told you about some cool movies and i hope you go check them out and uh, i'll be talking to you soon so thanks for listening 